let's revisit the forces that are realized when a part is ejected from an injection mold. The two forces are vacuum and friction. This is why it's important to have some draft angle. Any amount of draft, even a quarter of a degree, is better than none. Once the part begins to move off the core, the angled wall with draft will uh, separate from the core, virtually eliminating the vacuum forces holding the part to the core. Fillets and corner radii will also reduce the forces as well as increase the part strength during ejection. Be sure to draw polish the core in the direction of ejection so this reduces the surface friction. Ribs and gussets are an excellent way to strengthen the part allowing it to better withstand the forces of ejection. Another overlooked aspect of part design is designing for mold opening. Since most parts are ejected from the core, many part designers focus on designing a part which can easily be removed from the core during ejection. But you must not forget that the part must be easily removed from the cavity side of the mold as the clamp opens. Just as draft angles, polishing, radii, fillets, ribs, and gussets will aid in part ejection, all of these factors assist in separating the part from the mold when the machine opens. Some molds must sit closed for extra seconds to ensure the part does not distort from the core as the mold opens. In these kind of instances, the initial breakaway speed is slowed down, but unfortunately adds more to the overall cycle time. Lastly, the amount the mold must open to allow for part removal can have a negative effect on cycle time. This also increases the amount of energy used to open and close the mold. This point might sound a little trivial, but opening and closing an extra couple of inches or millimeters for a few million cycles can consume a large amount of energy and time, especially when you consider the weight of the mold. When we discuss cooling time, we're concerned about cooling line layout, differential cooling, and how to simplify a complex cooling situation. When laying out cooling lines, typically we focus on standard size diameters and we space them three and one and a half to five times the diameter. I'll repeat that. We space them three and one and a half to five times the diameter. Spacing the lines more than five times the diameter can cause differential cooling and shrinkage. Placing them more closely together will not significantly improve the effectiveness of the cooling system and this may affect the uh, structural integrity of the mold. The more effective waterline depth is typically two times the waterline diameter. This is typically close enough to provide enough cooling while avoiding hot and cold spots that can occur when the lines are too close to the mold cavity or core. My suggestion is you refer to some of the uh, mold design guides with respect to uh, line layout in some of these equations. It will be much more clearer. The ideal mold design will balance the cooling line layout with the ejection system layout. This can be a tricky balance in order to optimize and to ensure that uniform and adequate force can be placed on the part while cooling the part uniformly. In the reinforced cover plate that we've uh, pictured here, over 30 ejection sleeves are incorporated into this part. Our waterline layout will allow for an even cooling system across the part with additional cooling channels to strategically cool the clips located uh, on each side. As we discussed in some of the previous slides, the geometry of plastic parts are becoming more complex. When dealing with radical changes in wall thickness, a whole host of issues occur including inconsistent shrinkage, a higher probability of warpage, and longer cooling times. In the part shown here, the thicker part on the right hand side will shrink more than the polymer on the left hand side. So as you can see from the flow pattern, when the polymer flows through a sharp thickness transition, you get large fluctuations between the flowing polymer, melt, and solidifying polymer. Such a sharp uh, transition in thickness will create an even more cooling and shrinking differentials. 
increasing part thickness and using sharp thickness transitions often require additional cooling time to not only cool the part for ejection, but additional cool and part to overcome differential shrinkage and warpage. So whenever possible, smooth out the thicknesses and transitions, avoid sharp corners, maintain a consistent wall thickness, and use ribbing or gussets if necessary. You should be involved in the mold design process even if you're designing a plastic part. It's important that you design mold features such as side actions with room to fit adequate cooling lines. A common mistake is not to supply adequate cooling to slides, lifters, and cores. This is critical to maintaining a consistent process <clears throat> excuse me, and minimizing uh, differential cooling. Such an oversight can cost you many seconds in the overall cycle time. Uh, don't take this too lightly or inadvertently overlook this. As a side note, larger slides tend to be more durable, increasing tool life and minimizing downtime. When you're designing cooling, we sometimes use water baffles, bubblers, or spirals. These allow you to bring cooling closer to the specific mold feature or to areas where additional cooling is necessary. When designing a part for bubblers, uh, keep in mind the cooling line must be able to flow to and from the cooling feature. The point is you need a consistent flow of water in order to transfer heat and to maintain a constant mold temperature. In some instances, the only way you'll transfer any amount of cooling is through the use of thermal pins. If you must use a thermal pin, try to stay with the standard sizes as these uh, tend to get more durable, reliable, and they're also cheaper than custom sized thermal pins. Also, these pins work best when used in a vertical fashion and lose much of their effectiveness when used horizontally. Uh, for example, sometimes you'll attend a trade show and you'll hold a thermal pin and place it in a bucket of ice water where you can feel how quickly the rod transfers the cold. But keep in mind that you're in a vertical position. Also, you can make an insert, cavity, or core into a thermal pin. The point we want to stress is some cooling is better than none. The more you design a part to accommodate proper cooling, the shorter your cycle time will ultimately become. When designing for cycle time reduction, always try to accommodate stripper plate ejection. So it probably comes as no surprise that when you hear of molds running less than three seconds, they often use stripper plates. There are many plastic part applications which utilize ejector pins to remove a part which could have been designed to be ejected using a stripper plate. This would obviously result in a significant cycle time reduction. When designing a plastic part, it's a good idea to get everybody involved. This includes mold designers, process engineers, material specialists, machine specialists. The chief reason is that everybody's looking at it from their perspective. For this reason, we suggest concurrent engineering for virtually every new product design or project or when you have to retool an existing product.